You know, Melissa, people are always asking me, like, what if I could go back in time in poker and could actually yes. redo things? And then you gave me this idea today of this backpacker analogy that we're going to talk about. Do you want to introduce that and how it relates to starting out in a poker journey? Yeah. So I was thinking, I was thinking about this because I saw an interview with a long distance backpacker in the United States. We have this trail called the Pacific Crest Trail that actually goes from Mexico to Canada. So you can walk the entire thing. I don't know if you've ever heard of this mm. or not, but the people that do it, like there's people that do it the entire thing and they walk the whole way and it takes like months. And anyways, I was listening to an interview with a hiker who does this, like he's like a serious hiker and he was talking about how like what he puts in his bag, like his pack is, is like really important because if it's too heavy, then it could take too long for him to hike and it could be life-threatening. And if it's too light, obviously he won't have the material he needs. But he said one thing that I thought was interesting. He said, you know, people pack what they're afraid of. So he was someone that went with like very, you know, minimal food and kind of minimal. I don't think he brought like a weapon with him to like defend against animals or anything. Like he just was like very, very light. And I like the idea of like you pack what you're afraid of. And I think for me, when I think of like playing poker and what we do when we sit down for a session is, you know, what are we carrying with us? Why are we carrying it with us? Do we need to be carrying it with us? What value does it have? Is it something that is actually useful for us in that session? Or is it something that reflects a fear that we have? Or is it something that maybe reflects an arrogance that we have about the game or the other players? Anyways, all of that's kind of a long way of introducing this idea, but I wanted to start with that today because I think it's an interesting concept to talk about. Yeah. I mean, that in essence is Poker Distilled, the name of this show. And yeah. while not every episode is going to be about simplifying the game, we are going to try to bring people a psychological and philosophical take on poker, how they can improve their overall ethos and approach to how they conduct themselves within the game and their relationship between themselves and the game and what that's going to mean is that we often get into these kind of topics where we sort through things and say like what's relevant what's not let me just come back on one thing this pack what we're afraid of how do you think that can apply to a poker thought process like what kinds of things do you think poker players pack into their I don't even know. Are we talking about a thought process here specifically or are we talking about yeah. an approach to the game like overall? I think both for sure. One of the things that immediately comes up to me, and this is something that I am certainly guilty of doing, and I think it's pretty common and it's kind of a natural response, but, you know, like not wanting to get drawn out on, you know, on hmm. a certain board or a certain texture, like, you know, you have an overpair and there's two cards to you know, two diamonds on the board or something. Okay, I have to make sure that the opponent doesn't make their flush or I'm really scared if that third diamond hits on the turn. And I think that those issues are reflecting a fear. So like we're packing that fear as a way of, I think unnecessarily trying to protect ourselves from the pain of losing to a flush on a certain board or texture when we feel like deep down, maybe we're the ones that deserve to win that hand for whatever reason. And so that's kind of the first thing that I think when I think of like what I try to unpack it. And the reason I like this, the, like the idea of like a backpack is because for me, like I'm a very visual thinker and it's very helpful to just like think about like, okay, physically removing things from a backpack, just like you would, like if you were done hiking for the day, you like take out your, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a hiker, but I imagine that there are things that you remove from your back at the end of the day. <laughs> and so one of like, you know, just imagining that happening and, but doing that with like poker concepts. So like, here's me removing this fear of getting drawn out on. Here's me removing this, you know, emotional attachment that I have to, you know, pocket aces and feeling like this needs to bring me money. This needs to bring me riches or else, you know, mm -hmm. I'm doing something wrong and the universe is unfair. You know, here's me unpacking this kind of moral justification that I'm bringing to the poker world, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many things that I want to come in on there. And this is exactly why I wanted to do this show is that when we've been doing coaching sessions, and I think it's important just to provide a little bit of context on who we are. I'm a poker coach. I've been doing this gig a while. I make tons of content everywhere. 
I'm fairly experienced these days in creating poker content and you have been my student for the past six, seven months, something like that. And you've been playing poker about a year and we used to, well, we always tend to get into philosophical debates in the middle of coaching sessions. And I always tend to feel like, man, I better push this along because Melissa's paying for coaching right now. So we better get this going. But then there's always so many things I want to jump in on and sort of like have a explore in more detail that come up. And this is a great environment to do that. And even just what you said there, there's a few things I'd like to like touch on. So firstly, the idea of fear. I think this is like such an innate thing whenever we do anything to which we're not really acquainted and we're not used to. Because from an evolutionary perspective, being alive is the number one priority. That's what's primary. But when survival or the idea of your life ending, however we can sort of metaphorically transpose that into a poker hand, when that enters the, the realm of the poker hand, we're now dealing with like a complete screw up. We're dealing with like completely the wrong train of thought because losing the hand isn't ceasing to exist, it isn't losing the ability to procreate and pass on your genetics or anything like that, that we're conditioned to try to do at all costs and put before all else. It's actually just like some hands you have to lose and some hands it's okay for the flush to get there and just to go with that one example. So it's hardwired, isn't it? When you start doing something that you're not really skilled at, that you have these innate sort of reptilian brain, archaic evolutionarily gained mechanisms that just fire by default. And then you have to do so much uninstalling and reinstalling is the analogy I often use with students and had a lesson this morning where I was doing that. I was like literally just uninstalling. My, my last YouTube series, that's what we're doing with the student Jess. We're just uninstalling things from her game and putting other things in. And I love the, the backpacker analogy. The second thing I wanted to come back on is that I'd imagine that backpackers do sometimes remove things from their bags, but they probably have like bananas there that they forgot about that like welded to the bottom of the bag and are black and stuff. But yeah, I'd imagine they do generally remove things. Um, it's an awesome analogy and that, that thought of like actually taking fear-based things out of your game, we pack what we're afraid of. I love it. I think we can really work but, on that. But like, there's also like, you can go too far, right? Like I think like we can't be these like uh, hollow, empty emotionless shells of like, like we're not robots, right? Like I think a lot, especially like once you study or start studying with like solvers, there's this kind of like, like robot envy. Like we get, like, we're like very, we want, like we wish we like weren't human in some ways. And I think I, it's like obviously a pretty big topic, but I think like we can't unpack everything, right? Like we're going to take with us certain things that we've experienced in prior sessions or, you know, memories or subconscious I think subconscious emotions that we carry with us just as a matter of being human and experiencing, you know, a kind of chaotic world. So I think like it would be a bit like arrogant to think like I'm going to just like be in this like total Zen state of like I'm an empty vessel and I only receive what is absolutely necessary. And I'm not going to feel pain. I'm not going to feel emotion. That's ridiculous. I think those things actually you can't take out of your bag. And so like, what do you do with them? Like those, that, that's like the water, like every hiker, like I think like you have to carry water, even if mm -hmm. you're just like a certain like minimalist or something, you have to have basic, you have to have food and water. And I think those are like the things that we can't remove, but that's okay. And that's part of it. That's part of playing too. And that's part of, I think, what we sit down and deal with every day when we play a session. So it's about thinking about what can we remove and what do we keep? And, you know, finding that kind of balance and that mix if we can. Yeah, that's awesome. And today we're going to talk about some of the things that from your own personal journey, you've yeah. been playing about a year now, that you would remove or would have chosen to maybe not pack in the yeah. first place or have therefore had to improvise and remove along the way. And I know I've helped you with some of that in coaching, but there's probably other things I've never heard you talk about. And I, I don't know what you're going to say today. And I wanted it to be that way because I want this podcast in which we distill poker to be off the cuff. I want it to be conversational and so did you. So we're going to get into those things and see what other ones there are. But yeah, I, I totally agree. I think there is actually a very unhealthy, delusional mindset among poker learners. And one thing you might hear me do a lot in this podcast is rant about how sick I am of certain misconceptions and like absurdities, as you said. It's actually absurd to think that you can become so robotic that you don't care. Like I'll say to a student, so, you know, you made this river decision because you were really scared of not winning the pot. You felt like you had to win the pot. And they'll say, yeah, and that's so stupid. Like, I know that's wrong and I know that's bad. And like, I need to not do that. And it's like, wow, how simple. You just need to not have desires. You just need to not have yearnings for things. 
it's impossible for humans. So maybe we do need to take the fact that we are these emotional creatures and we need to use that for the good. And maybe it's not a case of removing from the bag fully. Some things get tossed out there and you know, tossed down the mountain. Don't actually litter, you know, put them in a compartment, bin them later. But, you know, some things get put in separate bags, pockets, pouches of the bag. Other things get discarded. Other things get left in the main compartment. Maybe it's a knowing how to use your human faculties sort of thing when it comes to playing mm -hmm. poker and channeling them into the right thing. So shall we address sure. some of the things specific to poker that you wish you had known whether to pack at all, maybe to unpack now, maybe things that you just would never have taken in the first place. Hit me with the first one of those and we'll see what, yeah. we, what we think. Yeah, so I think I think my kind of start in poker was pretty typical in the sense that I played, you know, randomly with friends and, you know, every now and then I would like sit down to like a local tournament or something like that with like, you know, a $50 buy-in or something like that. And I, I lost a lot, but I liked, I didn't, I had no idea what I was doing and, but I liked playing and I liked the strategy of it. And, and then gradually I kind of got more interested in it. And then, like you said, about a year ago, I decided to kind of take it seriously. And by that, I mean like devote a significant amount of time to studying and, and learning and not just, and, and playing seriously. But I think like a lot of players, I started off with like free content. <laughs> so I went online and I watched YouTube videos and I listened to a few other podcasts and did what I could to kind of spend the least amount of money to invest the least amount so that I could like put everything into my bankroll that I played with. Which is another supernatural, like, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. a really super, That's okay. it's a very natural human inclination when you don't know whether you're committed to something yet to preserve resources. So the preservation of resources, just like the fear of losing the pot, the fear of death is one of these innate human things that actually is holding us back right at the beginning of the journey. The mere desire to not get good educational paid content immediately. I know what you're going to say, right? It probably installed a lot of those things or put a lot of those things in the bag that we may have come to regret later. Yeah. I mean, it, it just totally scrambled me so that I was, I had like, there was almost this kind of schizophrenia to it. I had voices coming at me from all angles. So it was like, this is GTO and this is, you know, um, what to avoid. And here's what you want to do before a session. Here's what you do after a session. And like, I don't fault anyone for, you know, making content. I think like, obviously like people are going to do that and they're continuing to do that and that's fine. But for me, it really didn't work. And I felt really overwhelmed. And a lot of times I would leave a session and have no idea what, regardless of whether I had won or lost or was stuck or anything like that, I had no idea what I had done and whether that was anything that I should repeat. <laughs> so like, and then on top of that, I play a hundred percent live. I don't play online at all. And so I also had the, you know, the other players, at the table and, you know, picking up things they say, you know, like, oh yeah, you had a draw, you have to call that. Or I was repping trips there, or I was, you know, all of these kinds of things that are just like repeated, like ad nauseum and become a part of the poker language. I just absorbed all of that. And at the end of the day, it left me feeling really kind of confused and scattered and very unsure of myself. And really, I think in some ways it made me feel like I was better than I was, but it also made me feel like I was worse than I was. So it left me in this really unstable place that I think led to a lot of like unnecessary stress, certainly a lot of financial loss. And I'll just tell like a quick story because I think this is important. It's certainly important for me. But so when I first like started playing, I kind of had like a little bit of a sun run and like did well and then went on like. I don't even want to call it a downswing because it wasn't because of variance. It was because I didn't really know what I was doing and everything just kind of caught up with me. There's probably some variance involved, but for the most part, it was really just a technical issue and also a mental game issue. And I lost a lot and I lost kind of more than I ever expected to lose. I was playing one, two. And I remember sitting in the poker room one night and like, I was down to like my last like $500 in my bankroll. And I was like, I can't invest anymore. I can't afford to invest anymore. And I remember thinking like, maybe poker just isn't for me. Maybe I'm just not meant to play. Like, that's fine. Like maybe I can find like a more like normal hobby, <laughs> like do something like the rest like hiking, of the world right? understands. Yeah. I could hike. I could hike. Although I think that's 
somewhat abnormal in a lot of ways too that's more especially abnormal. with the threat of animals oh, and also just the nothingness of like like where is this sort of i'm a very stimulus driven person i need a lot of that but yeah yes. so, so you're in this sort of the yeah it sounds like as bad as it got like the trough of your your poker career graph kind of thing yeah what happened next so far <laughs> so far there's always i guess things can always get worse but for me at least that was like the the bottom of it and then like I won a hand and it it's almost like something out of like a book or movie because it was like so stereotypical but then like I won a hand and then I won another hand and then before I knew it like I was kind of like going back up again and I have sent that's when I started to be like okay I don't want to get to that place again and so I need to learn what I'm doing and I need to kind of center my training and my um, study so that I'm not so scattered and I'm not just kind of this mess of a player and so anyways unpacking what I wish I had packed that I wish I had packed the kind of random pieces of advice and technical uh, knowledge that I picked up in online and live because it would have saved me I think a lot yeah if you're serious about poker then you'll know that there are two main ways to study the game on the one hand we have the theoretical often known as GTO approach where we're looking at Nash equilibriums we're trying to figure out what is the most unexploitable and highest EV strategy possible against two perfect players? Then, on the other hand, we have the exploitative strategy, which is where most of the money in the real world is really made, which is about picking apart deficiencies in your opponent's games. Both of these things are incredibly difficult to study. The theoretical side is hard to study because when you look at a solver, and many coaches recommend that you just study with solvers on your own, what you'll find is you're basically looking up the answer at the back of a mathematics textbook. Seeing that answer in no way equips you to solve the problem yourself the next time, and so, inevitably, the student finds themselves lost at the table, no idea how to apply that solver output that they looked at with all of the complicated frequencies, ranges, and EVs. I was sick of that. I was sick of students studying with solvers before they understood how the game worked, and so I decided to record the Carrot Poker School. This is a rigorous academic course. It's just like something you would get in university. Poker is a very academic and rigorous topic, so I thought such a course was the only way to truly teach the game properly. The Carrot Poker School, across 33 videos of footage, the Carrot Poker School shows you how to understand the inner workings, the laws of physics of the game, as it were. The Carrot Poker School gives you the bedrock on which to base the rest of your game, including all of that juicy exploitative stuff where the money is really made. I've found that Carrot Poker School graduates, people that have taken our 33 hour long video course, even people who have just taken the first grade of it, because it's split across three grades, are so much more capable of learning exploits and having a strong win rate and moving through the stakes. Without a foundation, without knowing why and how the game works, it's incredibly difficult to glean a lot from solvers or to understand where your opponent's main deficiencies lie and how to truly take advantage of those leaks. Head on over to carrotcorner.com today to have a look at the syllabuses of grades 1 through 3 of the Carrot Poker School and if you do decide you want to take the plunge and give yourself a complete poker education then you can save 500 UK pounds by grabbing our full scholarship bundle and getting all three grades at the same time. Perhaps my favourite thing about the Carrot Poker School is the amount of feedback you get along the way. There are homework tasks with feedback from me after every episode. And of course, our end of grade exams. There are three of these in the courses. There are three grades. You can have a go at the exam yourself. This will take you probably one to three hours, depending on how much time you want to put into it. And then you can watch the corresponding feedback video where I give you a complete rundown on how the perfect exam answer should go for each question. There's no other poker course that's interactive that will give you such a strong foothold in poker theory. Not just what, but why and how. Check out at carrotcorner.com. Now let's get back to the content. So it's almost easier in some sense to teach a completely blank slate of a student than it is to work with someone that's been absorbing random scattered material from all sources. I was saying that today that if my student had had no tuition at all, it might actually be easier you know, to get them winning faster. It's really funny that, again, there's so many things. I feel like I've got such a scattered brain that, like, all the way through your story there, there were, like, little things where it's like, I must remember this, I must remember that. But one of them was that, isn't it funny how these little moments can make or break the entire trajectory of your life? Like, I remember coming home from... I hadn't played poker in about five months or something. I'd just given up. It was, like, before I actually became 
a successful winning player before I sort of made a run through the stakes in like 2010, 2011. So this must have been like 2009. And I came back from the pub one night and I had like maybe like a few hundred bucks still on Poker Stars. And I was like, I'll just play some 25 NL, you know, because I want to. And I went on some sun run and then just never stopped playing poker and never stopped making it my, the main focus of my life from that point onwards. So I do wonder whether that was always kind of destiny or whether these little sort of sliding doors moments, I guess you would call them, talk about like the movie or the book, do define like our careers in some way. So that's really interesting then. So this free content, this urge to grab free content first and then think maybe, well, one day maybe I'll invest in tuition, but not right now, not right at the start of my poker journey. People are so unaware, so dangerously unaware of what it means to fill your head with things that sound authoritatively taught like when you're sat in the card room people aren't going oh, oh by the way melissa you know i'm not very good and i'm a losing one two player but you should really bet for board coverage there they're not they're not saying that they're like oh you need to have board coverage oh you gotta protect your hand from the draws and they say it as if it's like the most automatic like a priori truth that's ever existed and so for a new player you're in that environment hearing this you're hearing people with youtube channels twitch channels streamers with followers people that have surface level authority but can you imagine if that happened in because poker is not a humanity it's not politics it's not philosophy it's not an area where a layman can hit the forefront and can compete against any theory they want like in philosophy i remember that's what i did at university a lecturer saying to me you guys are already at the forefront when you're in philosophy you can already like write what you think and compete with the big guys like in your own way poker is more of an objective science it has a real objective structure to it can you imagine that being acceptable in a non-humanity university subject, like an act, like in engineering or physics or mathematics? Can you imagine someone coming in and just being like, actually 357 has different universal laws from all the other numbers and it should be treated specially with different equations, uh, like duh, everyone knows that. And then other people just having to accept it. It's just so absurd, isn't it? Like how poker, Yeah. but it's not absurd. It's because it's a new discipline. So the reason I think this happens is that poker is actually extremely new. It's a really complex subject, just like physics, but it's so new that we don't have all of the research. We don't have hierarchies and institutions that uphold the structure of the academia of poker. We don't have rules about who's allowed to teach and who's not and who can make content and who isn't. Although I like to think the cream rises to the top in that respect. But yeah, you wander in there as a weaker player, as a new player, and you're bombarded with nonsense from day one that sounds like they know what they're talking about. So who can survive this minefield? Who does pack their bag correctly? Anyone? Yeah, I haven't met anyone. And I think like you, all, there's also a little bit of a difference with your example of like more academic sciences and things like that. I mean, I suppose people have, obviously people have like a natural talent for science, but it's more just, or math or something like that. But it's more just like, they figure out what's been done before quicker than other people. Mm -hmm. And then they can build on that, mm -hmm. right? Like that's like, I think what you would call like most like, you know, most people at MIT are probably in that category. They're learning it faster and they're able to build on it quicker. And I think with poker, that's certainly true, but there's also a talent element to it. And I think this comes in more for live players than it probably does for online players where there's people who I think are more just naturally emotionally sensitive at the table and can pick up on things like, I guess the word, I don't really like the word live tell because I think it's like a really vague concept and it, and I think it's helpful to be a little bit more specific than that. But for the sake of this conversation, we'll just say like some people are better at live tells than others. Well, you know, think, you know, I don't know if we should accept that because okay. I, I know that we're both unhappy with that being the definition of what you're talking about because we've talked about this before. Yeah. And I think what you're actually talking about, and I agree it's like a time and place emotional intelligence and social awareness yeah. of what's happening at that moment in time based on lots of micro clues environmental things that are going on and you, yeah. you're someone who is very good at that side of things relative to the average person in my coaching opinion and you pick up on all that stuff quite well but it's not just that you're going oh his eyelid moved there his hand is in this position it's not like that rudimentary but i do agree with you as well just to quickly come back on the point about like the talent side of poker there is a huge element of that. When I was comparing it to academia and like physics and things, I was talking more about the getting up to speed part, the learning of how the game works okay. and the sort of object, yeah. the objective part of it. But I totally agree with you that there's this other element to the game, not just in 
live but in online too but yeah you know predominantly live but let's get back to what you were saying about this sort of time and place social awareness emotional intelligence how that factors in so i think it is a huge point yeah it is and i think it has to do with being able to pay attention over a long period of time so like not it's really hard i think with you know obviously everyone at the table has their phones and i'm like guilty of this too especially if i get into a hand where i feel like i made like a huge mistake or i did something wrong as a way to like numb the pain i just start looking at my phone because it takes me out of it and i notice that like this is a habit that i'm trying to break a little bit like rather than like immediately start looking at twitter or something like sit with what i just did <laughs> like stew in it a little bit like like you know take my medicine if you will and like not in a way that would tilt me or damage me in the session but like in a way of like absorbing it rather than like constantly going for like an emotional buffer a way to like numb the pain but i think in general being able to pay attention over a long period of time to certain things that are you know that stick out certain patterns of behavior certain you know ways that people talk or things that people say i mean i think it's really helpful when you first sit down to a table if you don't know the players you're playing against you know listening to how they talk about hands i think you can pretty quickly understand you know, what their level, what their background is, and maybe how they approach poker. Now, the flip side of this is I've done this, and I've been absolutely wrong. So of course, yeah. <laughs> there's, always, there's always a caveat. Like, I sometimes I think someone is like a really good player based on these kind of external things, and then I realize they're not, and vice versa. So I think that's kind of what I was getting at with the live tell part of it. So where does that fit into the backpacking analogy, then, like this other side of the game that we've talked about, like the first item in the sort of poker general poker backpack being i wish i'd unpacked really quickly or just like looked at them examined these like false prophecies these like illogical teachings that don't fit into the the true objectivity of the game and like not put them in the bag with that side of things before we move on to your second point that side of things about the more emotionally aware human element of the game did you have to like take your own sort of emotional you're quite an emotional person as you've said to me before you're quite tapped into what's going on around you emotionally and you're quite sensitive to things around you did you find that you were able to take that and just make really good reads on people because i do think some of your reads are like very strong and, and, and right a lot of the time or did you find that like that natural instinct just like it does in the objective technical realm actually caused you to make an erroneous conclusion about an opponent's range or likely holding or player type because you didn't have enough poker knowledge yet to know how to take that raw data, if that makes sense. I certainly think both is true for sure. I think that I've over relied on, I mean, I think like live tells in it's more natural to like the world outside of poker. So like you meet someone for the first time, they come across a certain way in your mind, you're thinking, oh, this person's like a nice person or this person's maybe aggressive or a jerk or whatever. That's something that is natural to, I think, any kind of human interaction. Bringing that to the poker table is also natural, whereas like the more technical side of it is a little more unnatural. The the sense of like having to separate your emotions from what's actually happening on the table is unnatural. So I think when I first started, it was easier for me to kind of rely, and I used it as a crutch, I think a lot of times on like what I would consider to be like a live tell, like, oh, this person is like clearly like pretty fishy or this player hasn't played a hand in you know two hours so when he raises under the gun like he's clearly strong I'm gonna fold my you know whatever you know like sometimes that helped and sometimes it was completely wrong and I think that the live tell made up for what I lack in technical knowledge and I think still kind of does but I think this is like if you may have more points on this but I do think this actually leads really well into my next item that I wish I unpacked. Let's do it. If you want to move on. Okay. So the other thing I I think I wish I unpacked, and this gets into what we were just talking about is like stories. So there's one of my favorite writers uh, is a woman named Joan Didion. She passed away a couple of years ago, but she was a, she wrote fiction, but she also wrote a lot of nonfiction. That's what she's pretty famous for. But one of her collections of nonfiction is called, it's the title is We Tell Ourselves Stories in Order to Live. And I really liked that title. I like the idea of like, we tell ourselves stories because I think this happens to me at the poker table all the time. And I wish I unpacked it because I'm naturally like someone that has a little bit of an imagination. And so a lot of times I will tell myself a story about a certain player or a certain hand. 
and stick to that story and react to that story, despite all the red flags telling me that this is not the way to act. And I think that that's a natural reaction. I think stories are what we need stories, obviously, to live, but they can easily trick us and they can easily provide a sense of false comfort and a sense of stability in a world that is not stable. And so one other quick example is I was in a session a couple weeks ago and like I kept getting dealt pocket tens and I kept losing with pocket tens. So I would, you know, someone would, you know, flop something better than me or I would get out drawn or, or whatever, or someone bluffed me one times and I folded and it was wrong. And I kept losing pocket tens, but I kept getting dealt pocket tens. And I remember like after the fourth or fifth time I got dealt pocket tens in the session, I literally like had this voice inside my head that was like, I'm so unlucky. Like, why do I keep getting pocket tens? It's curse it's like, it's like the curse, you know, which is completely illogical because, you know, pocket tens is a really good starting hand. And I like pocket tens, but in that session, I had worked myself up into this narrative that pocket tens were just going to doom me and doom my session and just like bleed my bankroll. And none of that is true, but in my mind, it was a very consistent narrative and it made sense as a story. It's like today's story is, you know, how I lose like three buy-ins with pocket tents. Like that's a very convincing story. So I wish I had kind of packed that. Yeah. We should also note that you used to, you used to write yourself, you know, you're very yeah. into reading and you're definitely someone that loves that side of life, you know, like the narrative side of it, it makes life interesting to you. And I think it's the same for many people. And I do agree that like this whole narrational thing is so common like you come at this from your own experiences and just like the raw data of what you've gone through as a poker player and i come at this through this like almost curmudgeon perspective of this old grouchy poker coach that's seen it all so many times and is unmovable like some kind of like grumpy grandfather head of the family sat in the rocking chair just being like mm -hmm, yep i've seen that so many times and I've, what i've seen so many times it relates to your second item that you wish you'd unpacked i.e. narratives is people saying well i thought that he thought that i thought that he thought that my range was blah 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 and they they literally have these narratives of not just the, what they think is going on but also what their opponent is going on sometimes they'll be like i thought this was an under or an over bluff spot because he would have interpreted my flop check as weak and therefore gone for x because of that because of this thing i read in the carrot poker school yesterday it's like hang on so this opponent because of something you read yesterday is now acting in a certain way based on something that probably doesn't even exist in, in their own mind. So I think that projecting of your own narrative onto the opponent as well can be like another layer to that. So it's about distance and it's about this very counterintuitive notion of my story is fluid and I don't actually know which book I'm reading until I've finished reading it. My book is actually branching and changing and morphing it's a lot of different potential books. It's like a Schrodinger's cat kind of idea that the, the book is neither one nor the other till you've reached the end. The hand, the narrative is neither one nor the other until you have perfect objective information. You never have that even when you see Showdown. So maybe it's just about saying, I'm on a tree. Maybe the narrative can be a tree. There can be a tree of narrative, just like there's a, a tree of nodes and decision mm -hmm. points and things like that. So you could have a likely narrative or a likely subset of narratives that are developing, but it's so open that even though like, eight main branches are all one sort of story there's another three on this side and another two on this side that are actually a different sort of story and when you get to the next node of the game tree now not the narrative tree then the narrative tree also adapts and you realize that you're on one of the minority rare branches of the narrative tree right so you're actually in a, a narrative that you thought you were in not very frequently so maybe it doesn't have to be this am i in one narrative or am i in another but maybe the narrative is not fixed and it's not set and it's actually a, a series of potential narratives, some more likely than others. And that outlook would allow you to keep creating narratives to a point, but then you're juggling more narratives now, you're branching them. It's almost like one of those stories that says, go to page 64 if you do this and go to page 118. Give yourself goosebumps, I think was the ones I read as a kid, like the R.L. Stein kids horror book. Shout out choose to, your own to adventure. Those. Choose your own adventure, exactly. So you don't choose your own adventure in poker, but you are. you have to be this very open-minded detached impartial observer who can keep track of where the story is going and maybe your task isn't make a story for this hand but maybe the story is making itself and you just need to say which book you're reading no i think that's i think that's totally right and it's you know you could zoom out even more and say like we tell ourselves a story about like who we are as a player and 
like what we deserve or, or what we're capable of. And for me, at least, like I sometimes fall into this narrative of like, okay, I'm someone who spends X amount of time studying. I work with a poker coach. I take it seriously. I deserve X. And maybe that is, you know, I deserve a certain amount of, you know, success in my career, or I deserve to win a certain amount of sessions over a long term. And even though this is something that I know is not true on the surface, there is subconsciously, I feel it because in life outside of poker, like if you go out and you like run every day or something, like you're probably going to be able to do a marathon. Like it's not like it's, you know, unless you have some other issue going on, you, you may not do it quickly, but you, you'll you at least probably be able to finish it because you've trained your body to a certain point And like, you can achieve something based on what you've worked for. But poker is not like that because you could put a ton of time into it and still run into bad variants or still have some kind of like emotional leak that just comes out on that day and slaughters you. Like I've had times where I feel like I've played like a perfect session in my mind, but I've made one mistake and that mistake cost me like an enormous amount of chips. And, you know, that mistake may have like, you know, for the whole week been something that I think about. And so there's this narrative of like, and I think we get this through like popular culture and how, you know, the idea of like hard work is framed for us is that like, you know, you put work in, you're, you're going to get X and I don't think that's necessarily a bad message or something that you should like disregard or think is untrue, but I do feel like in poker, like it comes with an enormous caveat. And that caveat is you're entering a world that is more chaotic and unnatural and alien, right? In some ways than our normal world. Yeah, the alien world problem is very much the idea that like the norms and rules that you've learned in life just don't carry over into poker. And this one particular type of narrative i guess that when i do x and x normally leads to y x will lead to y and i just need to keep doing it and that's true in the massively long term like if you were to play like for a live player you might have to play for years and years before that becomes like close to you know 90 or 100 percent certain which is crazy i remember teaching a guy who was a very successful pro in vegas in about 2015 2016 and he was a very strong player but one year you know he made something like 250k and then the next year he made like 80k even though he was playing better and it just shows you like the massive amount of the massive gulf between success one year and success the next year earnings salary if you will that kind of thing so yeah poker is the kind of game where you need to somehow fight back against your own narrative that there's un there's an injustice there because when you don't get the thing that normally follows like if i ran for the next year and then tried to run a marathon and just couldn't run at all and then could no longer run for no reason and there was absolutely no explanation it was just like bad variants like haha the gods have smited you now you can't run anymore i'd be pissed i'd be really unhappy and that's a very normal thing to be unhappy about because why wouldn't you get the carrot at the end of the stick why wouldn't you get your just desserts when you've worked why wouldn't you get the thing you deserve when you've worked for something because someone else has meddled usually like why would it be in the state of nature that when you go out, hunt a boar, roast the boar in the fire and go to eat the boar, that the boar is gone suddenly. Well, how can that happen? Well, another human has to have come and taken the damn boar in order for that to have happened. Otherwise, it would still be there on the spit. So when the boar is inexplicably gone from the spit, you want to throw the toys out of the pram, so to speak, because you're like, I need to fight now or I need to flee because that person that's come in and taken the boar is either going to kill me and eat me because it's the state of nature and that's what happens if we're going to go down the Hobbesian route. Or I need to chase after them and kill them because I'm faster and stronger than them and I can get the boar back and then eat them. So, like, this is what you do, obviously, Melissa, right in the state of nature, just eat, eat people, you know, it's fine. So this is very much a problem for the poker player because when this X normally leads to Y, X hasn't led to Y, therefore there's been a meddling or interference. I strongly believe this is how we're wired to make sense of the world. And then who do we blame? Well, we can't blame, we can blame our opponent. We can blame variants or we can blame ourselves. And all three of those things are horrific. Blaming your opponent for variants doing what it's doing leads to this sort of fight state and this sort of like wanting to reject your opponents as humans or poker players to say that they're unworthy and to like le live your life in this like illusion that you're better than everyone. And so many jaded players like that that just think all their opponents are trash and think they're great. So that's one thing you can do to account for the discrepancy. Secondly, you could blame yourself 
which is even worse ostensibly and leads to like a, a breakdown of your own confidence although it might lead to actually finding some mistakes if you do it within reason like you're saying you know sit with it for a while feel the mistake get to the bottom of it process it more healthily so that's maybe slight improvement if you do it well and then you have blame variance and i don't just mean state that variance is responsible stating that variance is responsible for you losing a pot and having the conviction to be secure about that is actually quite healthy but lamenting woe is me look i can't win look at my graph i'm cursed i lost eight sessions in a row i can't win with ace queen this sort of player is probably playing really badly and deferring their accountability onto variance so when poker throws you this disconnect between your hard work and your short-term results there are three horribly destructive paths you can take to account for that and the fourth and only one true path in my opinion i sound like a bloody prophet here would be to say do you know what it's possible this was a largely variance because i know variance is a big factor but it's also possible that my own volition had something to do with it so let me be accountable and analyze that later that's the only path that works and you can't avoid the narrative that you that things are unjust because it's evolutionarily wired into you yeah and nor can you, but you should avoid the other three paths that we outlined there and how unhealthy they are. One of the things that I did a lot, and I don't do it so much anymore, but I used to, I was very hard on myself and I would tell myself that like, I'm not a good enough player to run bad. So like, I can't just blame variance. Like it's something I did. And even if it is variance, then so what? Like I could have reacted to it differently. I could have done something differently. And so like the blame is always on me. And well, I don't think that that is 100% unhealthy. I do think it is fairly unhealthy, like you just explained, because I, there are other elements in play. And it's really, sometimes it's really difficult to kind of suss those out. But this is actually a good segue <laughs> into my, into my This next. is your job, Melissa. Your job is to stop is me derailing segue. and rambling yeah. the podcast on for six hours. So please, let's segue. I'm the one, it's my job to like poke the prophet and say like, excuse me, sir, like we have to move on. No, you're doing yourself a disservice there. I think that like your your hands-on experience of what it's like to be the poker learner is equally valid to my sort of oh, good. curmudgeonly good. armchair where I sit and rain down like a barrage of jaded experiences from. So I think it's fine. Let's let's proceed. Okay, good, good. The other thing I think I wish I unpacked is my most recent mistake. So I think like sitting down at a live session even on days where I feel like I did everything right. And that like hardly ever happens. And ironically, it makes me nervous if I leave a session and I feel like, okay, what did I do wrong? And I can't think of anything because then I feel like I'm missing something. I'm tricking myself and, you know, I'm being exploited in ways that like I'm not aware of. And that's kind of scary. But for, I would say 90% of the time I leave a session and I can point to like three, four, at least five, six mistakes that I made in various spots. But in the session, I think, going back to the hike kind of analogy, it's like you're walking along and you have this something in your pack that's really heavy and you think you need it. And then you just realize, okay, like this is just weighing me down. And you just like toss it out of the pack. That is like how I think about mistakes in session. And I find that to be really helpful. Even if it's something that is, I maybe I'm not hundred percent sure it's a mistake, but it's bothering me. Like I visually think of myself like taking that out of my backpack and just like tossing it on the ground and like walking forward because that has really like if you allow your like your most recent mistake, at least for me, my most recent mistake to kind of dictate how I play, then that is like a path to disaster in a session. And so regardless of whether I, I may leave a session and then later and going through the session, think like, oh, this was a clearly a mistake. What could I have done differently? Let me like think through it. Or it's something that you and I will talk over. But in the session, like, I don't care. Like, I don't care about that. Like, it's maybe it was like, obviously a mistake. Maybe it wasn't. But like, it's ancient history. Like, I'm moving on. I'm unpacking it. And I never did that when I first started playing. It's an incredibly liberating thing that I'm really bad at, actually. So this is one of these cases where you are way better at this than me. Because when I play bridge for example, which is like my sort of passion we play in our spare time. We're always like at the bridge club on Wednesdays and we play weekend tournaments sometimes and stuff like that. And my girlfriend and I, and we take it super, I take it really seriously in particular. She does as well a little bit, but I take it very seriously. And when we're sat at the bridge table and I make a mistake, I will crucify myself for like literally the next two hours. And I will sit there eating at myself. I'll be grumpy. I'll make more and more mistakes that will snowball. So I'm kind of interested in getting coached by you on this one 
I get conceptually that's a great thing to do and I try to get my students to do that. I call it the compartmentalization exercise where you put it away in the desk drawer. You say, because I know I'm going to talk about that with, you know, some kind of intellectual poker authority or maybe just analyze it with Pio or some kind of thing that's going to help you. Maybe just yourself when you've got more time is the authority, but there's some authority that's going to help you and you put it away in the drawer and you know that it's dealt with. It's like putting something in the schedule because you've written it down, your brain's going to stop pestering you. Because you press snooze, your brain's going to let you go back to sleep. It's a bit like pressing snooze, but I can't press snooze because the thing is too big and too restless and too empowered. It's like it's just grown way too strong really quickly. And then I feel like I just can't get it to shut up and I can't stop viewing myself as an inadequate bridge player, as like someone that should be doing better. And I, I can't stop feeling a sense of like burning angry shame at myself sometimes. So I wonder how you, when you realize that you had to do that, how simple a process was it for you to let go of that most recent mistake? And do you always succeed at it? Or is there any advice you could give me or give the audience listening of how to actually execute that? Because in principle, it sounds great. Here's the visualization trick, throw the thing out the bag. But if someone isn't as visual as you and isn't empowered by that, how did they succeed in that endeavor? So I am certainly not 100% perfect at this. This is still something that I deal with almost in every session. And I think it's a natural response when you care about something to want to be good at it. And I think that most people probably listening to this or watching this are in the category where you want to be good at poker because you care about it. You love it in a certain way. And I think like I'm in that boat as well. But when I'm able to do it successfully is when I can remind myself that this isn't a threat. The same way, like if you sustained an injury, you know, maybe you fell or something when you're hiking or you sprained your ankle, like you wouldn't sit there and like break your other ankle. Like you wouldn't like make it worse. Like you would, you, you would got the symmetry, you would, right? I mean, you would, yeah, one. exactly. Yeah. You would like try to continue going despite the fact that you have this really nagging injury. And I feel like that's another visualization that I use, which is like, I, like why make this any worse and why, why make this any harder on myself? But on a deeper level, I think it comes from an insecurity. So like, if you feel like, and I'm not saying this is what you're experiencing, but like, if you feel like maybe deep down, you're just not that good of a bridge player, or you're just like, not like capable of like being successful at it, then those mistakes will really like remind you of it and bring that to the forefront. Yeah, you're hundred percent right. I think I'm as a bridge player, just to use this analogy, because it is really like relevant for all the poker players out there listening to this. It's like, I know that I'm decent at bridge. Like I'm, I've done quite well at the, the game for how long I've been playing. But I know I'm nowhere near some other like really strong players that I see. And that makes me feel like, well, why am I not just better than everyone in the world? Like, why am I not just like, I have this like ridiculously high ambition for myself. And you're right. As soon as I then say like, I've failed and it's exposed that fragility. I think it's about changing the game. It's like I've lost at the game of trying to maintain the illusion that I'm some kind of bridge god. So let me change the game into one where I'm a kid that smashes the plate on the floor and kicks over all the cake because they dropped a crumb. And then I'll be good at that game because I'm really good at tantruming and smashing the plate of cake on the floor. So let me play that game instead or something like that. I think it's easy to be hard on yourself. I think that's like, like you're the most vulnerable person right i think like unless you're like a very cruel person or you're someone that is like capable of being aggressive and mean to other people i think like generally like if you're somewhat of a i mean i have no background in any kind of psychology so i'm just riffing here but i think that if you're someone that is like capable of like if you have empathy for other people it's like you turn the guns on yourself because you're the easiest target and you're also the most vulnerable and you're also the person that i think deep down you feel like you can treat the worst and still wake up in the morning and like move on with life and also too like like you don't have to be responsible like you're responsible to yourself but if you treat someone else terribly like that may lead to other things that are outside of your control but if you treat yourself terribly like you're the one that endures it like you can put on yourself so i think that's that's part of it but i do think it's worth noting at this point that this is basically very closely tied to jordan peterson has this book the 12 rules for life and rule number two is it two or three it is to treat yourself as you know, someone who's worthy of looking after, I paraphrase here, it's not exactly that. But it's this idea that like, this, as soon as the dog is sick, we will take the dog to the vet, we'll get up every day, we'll give the dog its medication right on time, we will never ever miss a dose of the dog's medication. But when it's us, and we need life saving, you know, pharmaceutical care, data shows that humans die because they just don't look after, they just don't take the thing they're meant to take, even when it's prescribed. So at the poker table or bridge table or competitive arena, we wouldn't 
ever berate someone else in that way. We would never tear. Imagine you were playing poker and I was coaching you and I tore you apart and told you how you were no good. You were never going to be as good as you wanted to be. And that that hand has just exposed your ineptitude as a player and the fact that you will never fit in with like the image you want to have. Imagine I said that to you as your coach. That's what we do to ourselves in that moment. It's kind of disgusting. Why do we have to suppose that others are worthy of this barrier being put up where it's not okay to transcend it and actually start being horrible, but we're not, but we can do that to ourselves. I think that's such a huge trap that you can fall into. And yeah, it's like breaking the other ankle, you're right. Have you ever had a session where that hasn't worked and I kind of know the answer to this already, but then you've like made some plays after that that have just broken the other ankle or thrown yourself down the mountain because you broke an ankle? Oh yeah, quite recently. <laughs> actually but oh, oh i did i didn't know this do tell me more i didn't know this I no no we discussed this hand. i know i'm being this sarcastic hand where... I'm being oh, okay <laughs> i know exactly what you're talking about you know where i you know i could have folded in a spot where every sign in the universe was like pointing to the fact that this player had a set and that my aces were no good and like this is just like something i should have listened to instead of jamming and losing um you know quite a significant amount in that pot but i think like getting back to you know, what does this need to kind of like berate ourselves in a session is for me, at least it comes down to fear. And this gets back to the first point of like, we pack what we're afraid of. And I think packing this is a sign that we're afraid of something. And I think what it means is that we're afraid of that. We're not good enough, that this game is too complicated, that all the, the work and the kind of mental and emotional energy that we've directed toward this and this vision of ourselves that we have, which is like, you know, maybe you don't envision yourself as like someone that's like, you know, winning the World Series or something, but you envision yourself as being like, like you're not, you're not envisioning yourself as like, I'm going to sit down and play poker every day and lose two buy-ins. And I'm going to do that every day until, you know, one day I die. Like, that's not what you're Some people do like, that <laughs> though, but it's worth pointing out that's their life. But yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. That's their life. Yeah. <laughs> that's our guest next week. No. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's the guy from your card room. Yes. <laughs> but I think like we have this image of ourselves and when that image gets corrupted, when that image gets threatened, it becomes a reason to be mad at ourselves and it comes out of fear. And for me, I mentioned it at the beginning of our discussion today, but for me, like the place of like utter fear that I want to avoid is that feeling of like being like sitting at a card room at three in the morning and having $500 left in my bankroll and feeling like I'm, I guess it's, this is a sign for me to go do something else to take up hiking or something. Do you know the, do you ever watch any of the films by like, do you know the filmmaker David Lynch? Every question you ask me of this sort, Melissa, there's a 99.8% .8 chance the answer will be no. Just so you're okay. aware, I'm very uncultured when it comes to film. He's a really amazing, he's an American filmmaker, but he's kind of like a really amazing filmmaker. But he's got this concept that he uses in a couple of his films called The Red Room. And it's like this room where it's like, the characters go and it's like the most surreal he, he his movies are very surreal but like it's like the most surreal point on the surreal journey and it's like where everything is backwards and it's just like utter chaos and that is what i always have in the back of my mind of like something i want to avoid so when i feel like i make a mistake and i get angry at myself it's coming from a fear that i'm regressing back to that point of like having no bankroll left being defeated and having to walk out of the card room like just like a loser and having to quit playing or something anyways i think that was answered what you were saying yeah that absolutely might, might have gotten off on a tangent i think like what always happens is we have a point it's a, it's interesting there's another five points that branch off of it we jump on them that's why it's so important that your job is to rein me in because you're maybe like you're not the best at this but you're slightly better at it than i am i'm even worse for going on tangents but yeah no, i think all of that's really true and i think it's actually quite analogous to just life and death chaos and order and i want next week we're going to talk about chaos and order i'm going to tell you about this dream i had that was like one of the most fucking harrowing and like metaphorical illustrative things i've ever experienced it was amazing i'm still thinking about it like this needs to be like a movie or something i've already nice, got the ai nice. image generator to try and depict it <laughs> unsuccessfully you wouldn't oh, be surprised God. to know but yeah like we're going to talk about chaos and order next week so i won't go into that too much but like if we just talk about life and death briefly it's like the red room or you walking out of what is that what is you walking out of the casino at 4 a.m and going to wendy's and being like what's my life with some fries and a burger that is actually the red room that is actually death that's your poker death you're actually talking yes. about there so yes. moving closer towards your poker death and away from poker heaven as it were or whatever the, the analogy where everything's been achieved and it's all radiant and wonderful 
of course that's the wrong direction. It's like going the wrong way on like an escalator or something like that. So anything that could even minutely take you closer to that extreme dismay is of course slightly triggering in that way and that's why it's so difficult to not go down that path but I love the fact that you've been able to imagine yourself just like throwing it away for now and you'll deal with it later and just staying in the moment I think staying in the moment and actually like saying no I'm still going to play the game of Pete tries to be a good bridge player or Melissa tries to be a good poker player rather than playing the game of Pete starts like sabotaging the partnership by playing hands badly and throwing the toys out the pram or Melissa damages herself in her bankroll by shoving in some random spot based on a weird convenient narrative may i add that you've concocted to justify that very desire so anyway we've done three points have we yeah of the five yeah. there are five points uh what well, i mean kind of i mean we're at almost at an hour right yeah I let's think. do the last two points i mean unless you need to unless we need to cut it short we can cut it short if you need to well actually i think what i did is i kind of merged my five points into three just in the course of talking so like i had five but I think we've kind of covered all of them. Excellent. Okay, so in that case, we can start to wrap up and I will just give a few final like summarizing statements or questions or whatever. So what we've really said today is that less can be more in a sense and that having modes of operating in your poker game plan backpack that are bad can actually just cause a ton of... It's a huge detour to success, right? Talking about the poker heaven, the place you want to end up. This can be a massive detour and it can be the equivalent, I think, to instead of just walking down a corridor and going into another room in your house of actually climbing out the window, running around the block a few times and then climbing in a different window. I think it can be that much of a detour and it can be really destructive. So let's just quickly summarize the points that we've talked about today and give like one closing statement on each in the hope that it will get people just to start thinking about their own poker backpack and what they can take out of it. So to do that, to summarize, we had the pieces of random advice that we'd picked up. Everybody watching this is going to have so many of them. Like no one is gonna be free of the bad poker learning that's out there, that's infiltrated the chat in the card room, the cesspit of live poker, as I call it, that toxicity of the wrong poker ideas. Any final thoughts on point one, what they could do to just discard them? Or do they have to replace it with something else? Or how do you go about that process of just being like, I don't want this, I don't want this, I don't want this. I don't think we like fully finalized that. That's a really good question. And I don't know. I know it worked for me. And this is going to sound like an advertisement for Carrot Poker School. But <laughs> I just, just honestly what happened, I was like, I can get all of my poker education in one spot. And it's a pretty easy purchase and I just you know I just do it once and I get the videos and I can watch it and everything and I don't have to worry about going on YouTube and pulling things from random areas so that's what worked for me but I suppose like finding one person or one kind of training content that works for you and sticking with that and being able to separate like I'm watching this stream now because I really like this streamer and I want to just see how they're doing on this run or whatever but like Maybe the way that they're thinking about poker is not something that I, not how I think about it. And that's totally fine. Like, that's totally fine. Yeah, like there is some objectivity here. It's not just going to be a case of like, people can say whatever they want and it's all subjective. There is an objective truth. And I guess what you're really saying here is that you need to kind of find the content that is dealing with the objective truth of the game. Because like, I don't want this to be a plug either. Like, this is not at all what the podcast is about, but... The reason I made the Carrot Poker School and, and made that course is just that I, I didn't feel that everything was ever fully in one place. And there were a lot of good things out there in the community. There were a lot of bad things out there. There was the odd good reg at the card room. There were a lot of bad regs at the card room spouting nonsense. But never was there like all the good stuff together in an objective way describing the laws of physics of the game. So I do think it's really important in that if you started, you know, studying psychology at university, you would have a psychology textbook. If you studied math, you'd have a math textbook. You would have some reference that you could go to for clarity this exists in almost anything there are manuals for things there is a bible for religion there is a textbook for a subject you need some kind of manual some kind of thing you can turn to but also there's the uninstalling part which we don't even have time to get fully into but they have to do that and somehow and that's hard and that, that is actually harder than learning the right stuff i think uninstalling can be harder than installing throwing things out can be yeah. harder than putting things in narratives all kinds of these. You don't have to be a literary enthusiast to have narratives. You may just have narratives about the way the poker world is going, how unjust it is, all of that stuff. Once you see them as narratives, that's great. 
it allows you to sort of let go of them once you see them as evolutionarily selected for it allows you to maybe free yourself of them a little bit and the narratives during the hand we talked about seeing it as a tree of stories not just one and being able to tell which story you're on not just assuming that whatever story you thought you were on initially has to be still the right story and then putting the blinkers on and not seeing the new evidence as it comes in anything else to say on narratives or should we summarize the next just really quickly like be aware of like when a narrative is warping reality so like a really quick example of this is like you lose a big pot and then your car dead for like two hours you start looking at something like five four offsuit or something under the gun and you're like this is starting to look good oh i can't resist <laughs> a bit of five four offsuit under the gun yeah it's like like this is something that you know like but that's the narrative like warping your mind and warping like what you know and so that's my yeah the narrative's actually saying you won't get any more good cards but you're still gonna sit here and if you sit here and do nothing you will turn into like a rotting statue so you may as well play the 5-4 it's like a really like sinister narrative isn't it absolutely it's amazing how the brain can take really recent things and paint the illusion that they've been going on for years or something that they're now the status yeah. quo because they've been happening for an hour and that's another absolutely. selected for thing that's really it's really tough it's really really tough but that's an, an example of like a narrative that will it's quite dangerous and then being able to take your most recent mistake even though it might be a bad one even though you might feel kind of awful about it and stop yourself before the point where you start abusing yourself before you start tearing into your self-image and changing your self-image into something awful because once you've done that there is no longer an admirable game for you to play you then have to play a different game which is i am a horrific person let me behave like one self-image is so important it's like me at the bridge table sabotaging myself you with the pocket aces or the hiker throwing themselves down the mountain because they broke their ankle it's that absurd any thoughts on most recent mistake and how people could just maybe maybe one thing they could do today if they make a mistake just one little thing mantra sort of monologue they could say to themselves I think this is also comes from that Jordan Peterson book, but treat yourself like you would a friend. So like if your best friend came to you and they're like, you know, I just made like this really big mistake today and I've really screwed up and I think it's all over and blah, blah, blah. You know, you wouldn't be like, you're right. Like <laughs> you're, you're terrible. I mean, maybe I would, because that's probably like Tough why love. I don't have a lot of friends. No, but in all honesty, like seriously, like you wouldn't like someone you care about, like treat it like, treat yourself like someone that you're like friends with, that you love, that you don't want to hurt and you don't want to make their life any more difficult than it already is. Because you are that person to other people. We've got families, we've got friends, we are loved by people and they see us in the way that we see others. So why can't we see ourselves a little bit like that as well? It's okay to be altruistic. It's okay to do things for your dog and love your dog. But also, yeah, like give yourself a fucking break. Like think about you're not defined by your most recent mistake. I think I love the fact that you called it my most recent mistake because we temporarily delude ourselves into thinking that we are defined by that one mistake and we're not. And when we free ourselves of that, we can keep the self-image of who we set out to be at the start of that session. Why are we there in the first place? Why are we in the card room? Not because we like Wendy's at 3 a.m., but because we want to be headed towards the poker holy grail, whatever that may be for us. And you can stay on that journey even when there's a little step backwards it doesn't mean you have to start you know throwing the cake on the floor because you dropped the crumb i think that's just such a common thing that people do it's such an easy game to play and we do play games with ourselves it's meta games not poker but at the poker table we play these other games the game within the game that we're playing in our own head and knowing which game to play is a really important one well that's the first episode of poker distilled guys Next week, we're going to talk about chaos and order and how these concepts relate to poker. We're going to be covering lots of different psychological, philosophical topics. Melissa and I will be back on a weekly basis. And I hope this enriches your understanding. If you do like this content, then do give it a little comment on YouTube. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear your feedback. And do smash the like button as well, because it will really help the podcast grow. Anything you want to add, Melissa, before we wrap up? No, I'm, this is really fun. And I'm excited to do it again. Yeah, it's going to be good. Do let us know what you think. We'll continue to produce this for as long as you guys are enjoying it and we're enjoying making it and loads more fun topics. So yeah, see you next time, guys. Thanks very much for listening.